What is history? For many, it's nothing more than names and dates. Quotation from a notable person. A monument to a forgotten past. But that's not what it is. Changing my name doesn't make me a different person. Telling you my birth date won't explain who I am, but my history can still identify me. I am my hometown and the places I've lived. I am my past accidents and the scars they've left behind. I am the 24 years of music practice that led to this soundtrack. I am the $2 I lost to Keeneland on a photo finish. As my history gives me my identity, so too does our history give us our identity. So no, history is not just a bunch of names and dates. It is how we discover who we are as members of the human race. Nestled amongst the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains in central Kentucky lies an unusual and exceptional institution of higher learning. Founded in 1855, Berea College engages in an educational mission based on one simple yet powerful motto, God has made of one blood all peoples of the earth. The college was the vision of this man, John G. Fee a Kentucky abolitionist who wished to create in Kentucky what Oberlin College is to Ohio, anti-slavery, anti-caste, anti-rum, anti-sin. Following this vision, Berea College opened its doors as the first co-educational and interracial college in the American South. Today it carries that legacy in ways such as the Carter G. Woodson Center, built in honor of the former Berea College student who became the father of America's Black History Month. Though much attention is given to Berea College's commitment to interracial education, its history as the first coeducational college in the South is also important. Today, the student population of the college is about 57% female, roughly even with a national ratio. However, in the mid-19th century, coeducation was a novel experiment in improving higher education, and in order to understand Berea College's history of coeducation, we need to examine the place where it started, Oberlin College. Located in upstate Ohio, Oberlin was the first coeducational college in America. Its coeducational mission is best exemplified by its second president, Charles Grandison Finney, who stated its purpose was the elevation of female character, bringing within the reach of the misjudged and neglected sex all the instructive privileges which hitherto have unreasonably distinguished the leading sex from theirs. However, Charles Finney never gave true rationales for coeducation. Instead, he left this job to his subordinate, James Fairchild, who would later become president of Oberlin himself. James Fairchild said there was a societal obligation for women to first be educated as human beings instead of simply as mothers. That said, his reasonings for educating women had little to do with women at all. He argued that having women around would exert a civilizing influence on men, improving their rowdy behavior. It would also make it easier for men to find wives. It should also be pointed out that this coeducation was not placing men and women on equal footing. The courses taken by women differed from that of men, with certain subjects such as Latin and Greek, which were required of men, being left completely out of the ladies' program. Female students were also required to cook and clean for the male students. Lucy Stone, an Oberlin graduate who would later go on to become a prominent member of the women's suffrage movement, noted that her academic schedule would be interrupted every Monday so that she could take part in doing the male students' laundry. There's more, too. 
James Fairchild was concerned that, in the absence of women, male students would generate romanticized fantasies of ideal feminine beauty in their minds. These fantasies would not only distract the men from their studies, but lead to that most immoral and self-destructive of activities, masturbation. However, James Fairchild argued that these venereal fantasies could easily be shattered by confronting men with the reality of women. In other words, if men had the opportunity to see what women were really like, they would be less likely to fantasize about them and instead keep their noses to the grindstone. So what does this mean? In practice, co-education at Oberlin was not the liberating influence one would expect. Despite Charles Finney's stated belief in the elevation of female character and James Fairchild's comments that women should first be educated as human beings, the reality is that women were brought to Oberlin to benefit the academic environment of men and to be molded into ideal wives. But how is this connected to Berea College? Well, it goes beyond John G. Fee's mission of creating an Oberlin in Kentucky. You see, James Fairchild, president of Oberlin, had a brother who became the president at another institution, Edward Henry Fairchild, the first president of Berea College. E.H. Fairchild attended Oberlin with his brother James as part of their first collegiate class in 1835. Like his brother, E.H. became a faculty member at Oberlin, working as the principal of the preparatory department. His experience at Oberlin, combined with his fundraising success, left him ideally suited to assume the presidency of Berea College in 1868. E.H. Fairchild kept up active communications with his brother James during their respective presidencies, but it doesn't appear that the topic of co-education came up in their correspondence. However, we do know that E.H. was aware of his brother James's address on the topic, thanks to this fundraising letter he sent to a professor at another college, which contains the postscript, that address on the co-education of the sexes was delivered by my brother. However, the biggest connection between the two brothers' beliefs on co-education come from this, E.H. Fairchild's inaugural address. He devoted more speaking time to co-education than he did to any other topic, and his justifications mirror those of his brother James. He argued that rowdyism, the natural result of separating men from the society of the ladies, is almost unknown and impossible in a school of both sexes. He also provides an additional reason that his brother James failed to mention, that male students would be more likely to study harder if women were in the classroom with them, as the embarrassment of failing in recitation in front of women would be all the greater. In fact, he believes that this potential embarrassment was a more powerful stimulus than any system of marks or prizes. He gave other reasons as well that having women around would improve music performances, generate a better social culture, and be more interesting to the surrounding community. To be fair, he also mentions that a co-educational atmosphere would provide a better education for women than what they could receive at an all-female seminary, in two sentences as reason number seven out of seven. It seems clear then that bringing women to Berea College was something done primarily in the service of men. However, despite E.H. Fairchild's primarily male-centric justifications for co-education, it is important to realize that once he'd made the commitment to co-education at Berea, he fervently adhered to it and improved it over the years. In 1875, he did away with the separate ladies program at Berea, a big step in fully integrating women into academic life. He was also responsible for the construction of the Ladies' Hall, a three-story brick residence for female students at Berea that became both a piece of architectural pride for the school and a lasting monument to Berea College's commitment to co-education. That building still stands today, renamed Fairchild Hall in honor of the president responsible for its construction. Though certain portions of the building are now used for administrative functions, its primary purpose remains as a residence hall for female students. However, while the hall remained after Fairchild's death, his commitment to women began to be forgotten. This even hit close to home. Fairchild's own granddaughter, Eleanor R. Fairchild, failed to see the importance of women going to college and abandoned her studies at Oberlin to become a dancer. And while she remembered her great uncle, James Fairchild, and his connections at Oberlin, she couldn't remember the name of her grandfather at Berea.
However, our story doesn't end here. Alongside the tide of co-education that came in during the 19th century, another current was building strength. The first true women's rights movement, first wave feminism. Feminism itself was hard to define at the time. This is perhaps best illustrated by the British author and journalist Rebecca West, who stated, I myself have never been able to find out precisely what feminism is. I only know that people call me a feminist whenever I express sentiments that differentiate me from a doormat or a prostitute. To better understand the nature of the spread of feminism, I went to speak with Dr. Rebecca Bates, a British and transatlantic historian currently teaching at Berea College, who works in the building named for Berea's third president, William Goodell Frost. I think um, to understand women's suffrage, it does need to be understood as an international phenomenon, and particularly in the United States, it's linked to the British experience. And the British experience is, is very different from the continental or European experience. In, in Europe, a great deal of the understanding of women's equality um, is understood as how do we gain social equality? But in the Anglo-American tradition, the idea is, how do we obtain political equality? In America, that political equality was sought through the women's suffrage movement. While the origins of the movement came before the Civil War, it wasn't until the turn of the century that the political groups organized by prominent feminists such as Lucy Stone, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and Susan B. Anthony began to gain traction. At the same time, Berea College found itself under a new president, William Goodell Frost. Inaugurated in 1893, President Frost's tenure is controversial today as it was under his administration that Berea College became racially segregated to comply with the Day Law, a Kentucky statute that forbade interracial colleges. However, he is also known for introducing a new educational focus, teaching the people of Appalachia practical job skills. So President Frost comes in the 1890s to Berea College, and when he arrives at Berea College, um, the college is in, um, in financial disarray. And he's in financial, the college is in financial disarray, and the United States as a, um, as a political union is frail. So I think the most significant thing to understand about the Frost administration is that it's recognizing Berea within and setting Berea in a larger political union. That political position is difficult to understand. President Frost's mother, Maria Frost, wrote a newspaper article entitled 10 Reasons Why Women Should Vote, Justifying Women's Suffrage. However, William Goodell Frost struck back in an article for the Berea Citizen on September 19, 1912, giving eight reasons why women shouldn't be allowed to vote, ending with the statement, we are entirely unable to understand how anyone can claim that women have a right to vote and deny that they have a right to vote on the question whether they wish to vote or not. If we think about this period um, at the beginning of the 20th century, um, third party politics are significant. And with that, um, suffrage becomes one more way of gaining a set of voters. In other words, we're sort of thinking of it backwards if we say, well, of course Frost should have supported women's suffrage. Um, and actually, it would have been a very radical position for him to support women's suffrage. He, he was not a radical person. Um, and so I think it actually makes more sense to see him that he, he's doing exactly what we should expect him to do. Though Frost's political views may have been typical of the time, they certainly weren't universal, not even within his own home. Though mainly known today for her role in establishing the Boone Tavern, William Goodell's wife, Eleanor Frost, was a quiet yet strong supporter of suffrage. Though she never spoke publicly on the subject, her journals tell of tensions between her and her husband. At night had talk with Will. Told him I saw he looked upon my suffrage attitude, 
with the same alarm he would feel if I announced that I intended to begin using opium moderately, that I might be overcome with it. Now comes the big question. Why does any of this matter? Women would go on to gain the right to vote in America with the passage of the 19th Amendment in 1920, right as Frost's term as president ended. Berea College would later refine its commitments to be more gender inclusive. It also developed a women's and gender studies program in the early 1990s. We no longer think that educating women leads to a deficiency of reproductive power that functionally castrates them as men did in the past. On paper, it would seem that the mission for political and educational equality has succeeded. However, there are still battles to be fought. At this particular moment, there are more women than there are men attending Berea College. However, when women graduate from Berea College, um, they are not as financially successful as men. And that's not anything to do with Berea College exactly. It's to do with national understanding of the relationship between um, that there is not a direct relationship between women's education and women's income. Something else in our society shapes that and determines that. And I think by looking at women's education at Berea and women's, and women's rights at Berea and the story of generally of women at Berea, we get to understand why those hurdles still exist. In 1870, a woman from Ohio named Lucretia Smith became the first woman to graduate from Berea College with a full college degree. That's all we know of her. There are no known photographs of her, no biographical information, just a line of text in a dusty book of names lying at Berea College's archives. She did something courageous and innovative in her time, and you've probably never even heard of her. She, like the history of women at Berea, is invisible. History can be made from these tiny stories of seemingly insignificant people as long as we have a conversation about them. Our remembrance becomes their immortality and their lives become our lessons. In making this film, I spoke with dozens of courageous women at Berea, the modern day Lucretia Smiths of the school. It is for them, those like them, and those who will come after that we must keep the conversation going. If we don't, their struggles will also be forgotten, and they, too, will disappear.